So um, this session focuses on distance learning modalities. And some of the ideas also overlap with what we've seen already. There was a little bit of debate among the planning committee about how to slot everything, because a lot of the topics overlap. But we'll begin with Heather Brown, who's at Newcastle University. And she's going to talk about um, engaging distance learners who have not a clue about economics in an economics course. OK, so welcome, everyone. Um, to start, I'm just going to start by giving a bit of background information. So, um, well, as you all know, health economic evaluation is used by varying degrees across the world. Um, and how widespread its use and its purpose depends on the design of the, health, the country's healthcare system. So, in England, the assessment of new health technologies takes place within the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence. Um, the acronym NICE, and it provides national guidance on the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of new interventions in the NHS. So it produces guidance for public health, health technology, and clinical practice. So because um, there's such a wide remit for health economics, there's a lot of interest from healthcare professionals to learn about health economics. They can kind of understand what's going on and perhaps conduct basic economic evaluations. Um, and so distance learning courses gives these busy healthcare professionals the opportunity to learn the basics in a flexible and convenient environment. So some of the challenges of distance learning are, as was um, discussed in the last session, is many healthcare professionals have no experience of economics, and that includes the quantitative skills that go along with a lot of um, economics teaching and the busy, their busy schedules means that they might need to engage the material in short bursts at times when convenient for them, which could not be conducive for um, group work or lots of other types of learning for traditional undergraduate or graduate courses. And therefore, discussion engagement with fellow students can be difficult, which can make the course seem a bit isolating and then sometimes students disengage from it. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is a distance learning course that I developed for it's a master's in oncology and palliative care. So it's all people who are working in some aspect, mostly nurses and some kind of um, clinician as well. And so this is our course website, which we have a platform that also feeds into Blackboard. So it's a 10 week course. And what I'll be so first, I'll just go, this course has been running for three years. And first, I was just going to briefly discuss some of the things that we found that didn't work. So basically, what we found that didn't work was setting weekly questions on a topic, um, and then having students kind of post on a discussion blog. Because basically, what you had is only a few people who were highly motivated and potentially had some experience of economics who would contribute. And then everyone else just wouldn't do anything. And then kind of the marks reflected this. So you had a few people did well, and the rest of people who either just passed or didn't pass. Um, so then after we found that out, what we did is we changed it. So we added a 10% participation mark. So this then would force people to participate. And it's a very rough mark. So it basically is how many times you <coughs> sign on online and post something. So if you sign on, say, five times, then you get a 50% out of the 10%. You sign on all 10, ta 10 times for the 10 weeks, and you get 100%. Um, and we changed some of the exercises. So one of the exercises I'm going to talk about is very similar to the exercise you discussed, Carolyn. But I made it into a group work exercise. Um, and then also we did an economic evaluation wiki, which I will go through. So the market exercise is I divided the class, because these classes tend to be quite small, so it's usually a maximum of 20 people. So divided everyone into groups of four, and it's just done randomly through Blackboard groups. And so we signed each person one role. So we had a reporter, a civil servant, an economist, and a politician. And each member of the team has one week to do their part. So these two assignments last almost the whole module. So it's four weeks for one assignment, four weeks for another assignment, and then two other weeks. Um, so the reporter basically finds an article in popular press that outlines a market failure in the healthcare system, and then they share that with their team. So this are just some examples of articles 
that people found last year. And then the civil servant summarizes the market failure being addressed in the article. So again, this is just an example from last year of one of the summaries that was provided. So each team member has to provide about a paragraph. And so then the economist uses economic theory to discuss the reasons why the market failed. So this is another example. So it's basically in one of those two articles, it was asymmetric information. So they have to pretty much to provide a definition of what asymmetric information is and show how that was reflected in the article. And then the politician has to crit critically assess potential solutions. So you have to think about ways you could overcome this market failure and write that down. And again, here is an example from last year. So it talks about how a lack of transparency led to the market failure of asymmetric information. And then, because a reporter potentially has the easiest task, they need to lead the next part of the group work where they have to collate all the different paragraphs into a coherent um, 1,000 word report. Okay, so that is a quick summary of the market exercise. And the next one is an economic evalu evaluation exercise. So what this does is it takes, it's all made up numbers and effects. So it takes five different, because it's an oncology thing, so it's all related to cancer. So it takes five different tests to detect um, cases of col colorectal cancer. Um, and then it basically has students do different aspects of economic evaluation. Um, so they do a incremental cost effect analysis altogether. So here's the basic example. And then the, again, the class is divided into different groups. So we have a group that's in charge of doing, estimating a cost effectiveness ratio, cost effectiveness plane, calculating ISRs, doing an efficiency frontier, and then assessing value for money. So here is what the cost effectiveness ratio group does. Um, so they basically are given the costs and effects and need to find out what the cost effectiveness ratio is. So it's very simple maths that they need to do. And then they just need to fill this out on Blackboard. And then from this, it looks like virtual colonoscopy would be the most cost effective, just looking at simple numbers of the five groups. Um, and so that's the first group. So then the second group needs to take this information done by the first group to uh, plot it onto a cost effectiveness plane. So they just need to, they're given basically just the box and then they have to fill in the information from the previous group. And then this just gives them some understanding. So this is on there of what it is that they're doing. And this exercise is slightly taken from Steve Morris's textbook and changed. OK, so then the next group looks at calculating incremental cost and effect. So it assumes, because we found from the first bit, that the virtual colonoscopy was a the most cost effective given just pure numbers. So we make this the base case just to make it easier. So now we look at comparing all the other treatments to this, which we decide, we say is current practice. Um, and they need to eliminate options, which are extended dominant, um, dominant. So again, they're given these numbers and then they need to fill out the incremental cost and the incremental effect. So again, it's using very basic math that we describe how to do, and no one so far has seemed to have a problem with just doing that sort of level of math. Um, 
And then the final thing is I have to calculate the ICERs, except and to identify that this strategy is dominated, so they don't need to bother doing it for that one compared to the others. And then the final group looks at drawing an efficiency frontier to compare multiple screening strategies. So it's just looking at alternative ways of illustrating cost effectiveness. So um, that is just sort of these lines here are what the different is what the group needs to fill in. And then they can compare that to the cost effectiveness plane and see other different kind of like just different ways of illustrating cost effectiveness. So then finally, all together as a group, um, so this is the whole class getting together to think of kind of if they were tasked with doing this at work, what they would, information they would need and kind of what would be their takeaway message from this exercise. <laughs> so some examples of what people said um, is talking about value for money. So it's all to do with the willingness to pay. So that's kind of saying that that wasn't presented in this exercise. They don't know what the threshold is for what, you know, if any of these policies be adopted, because you need to have a threshold to determine if it is cost effective or not. Um, some of the other ones just said, because they found for the first bit, virtual colonoscopy, so they're like, well, we'll just go with that. There's no point in doing all the other bits, because that was there from the start. Um, some of the other points that raised is kind of looking at, so this is all about screening, but saying, but after the screening, what happens? So then how much does it cost to actually treat colorectal cancer? Is it worthwhile to have the screening program in the first place? Um, another thing that's been mentioned is uptake of screening programs. So this just looks at cost, but it doesn't say how many people who would be offered the screening would actually go through with it. Um, and the same thing is that the idea of false positives and false negatives. So um, how well do the tests pick up actual colorectal cancer and how might that impact on um, future costs? So why do I think these exercises work? Well, the participation mark definitely acts as an incentive. So there was a huge change in how people participated once they had the mark. Um, and because it's the online environment which restricts what you can do, found that putting this in a weekly timetable, that seemed to work because people knew that they had a week to answer the questions. And from the, you can look at the times that most people signed on about 11 p.m., but they did all manage to do it at some point during the week. Um, and as well, I noticed from having these exercises that when, because I kept some of the topic discussion board things, but since people were working with each other in group, they're more likely to comment on other people's blogs and other topics because they sort of knew people in the class and felt like they could, um, you know, respond and converse with each other. So it overall improved the dynamic of the class. Um, and as well, the marks went up. So overall, all the marks of the students went up. So more people did better, which is good. And the students were happy, because in the first year, some of the students were like, oh, it was good, and other students were like, oh, I don't know. So the feedback on the modules has significantly proved that people felt that they had you know, engaged with other students and learned something that they could take forward into their other modules and into their work. And then that's it. So we have time for questions or comments. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I had a question concerning your discussion board. Do you provide them some structure of what is a constructive feedback? Because in my discussion, I find out with my students, especially the undergrads, I have to tell them. Just saying, hey, that's great, <laughs> doesn't give you a point. <laughs> so you have to kind of give them a structure. Here's what a constructive uh, discussion looks like, rather than just logging in to give the points. I haven't done that, but these are all master students, and they've all been working, so I haven't had that where you know they kind of they seem to already know that. And this module can because it's a two-year part-time program, and it's in the second year, so they've already been exposed to some of these things, so it seems to, 
that issue hasn't arisen yet. It's an, it's an undergraduate issue. <laughs> no, I thought it was master <laughs> students. But yeah, so if you're early in the program, you have to train them that they don't get points for me too. Um, but then if it's a second year course, then they have already been acculturated by whoever suffered with them the first quarter. <laughs> yes? So um, if, about the discussion board as well, how much time, you, you say you're the class of 20 students, so how much time are you putting into sort of facilitating the discussion on? A decent amount. So I look at it, when the course is running, I look at every night and I say it probably spends between an hour and an hour and a half. So it's a lot of time. Uh, what kind of training did you get to set this up? They didn't teach this back here when I was in graduate school. <laughs> I developed this course as part of the half in the UK. It's the Higher Education Academy, where you have to do, when you start, you have to take this two-year program to kind of learn about teaching. And the first year you do kind of different, it's like a two-week thing where you do basic stuff like feedback and learning outcomes and things like that. And the second year you do a project. So this was my project. So I had someone in medical education who ran the distance learning kind of modules at Newcastle University with my mentor. And they kind of looked at all the things and helped me develop the course. Can I just get that right? Every single starting faculty member in the UK does this and gets this? At least at Russell Group Universities, yeah. Wow. Great. Is there any other questions?